Don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. I wanna destroy passers by, cause I wanna be an Traffic light, your future dream is a shopping spree. Cause I Alright, hello there, thrill seekers. That was my rendition on ukulele of Anarchy in the UK or Anarchy for the UK? Anarchy? I, is it in or for the UK? I'd have to look that up. I think my version was a little bit better than the Metallica version, but uh, you be the judge. So last night I was having a little trouble sleeping, so I went over to my bookshelves and at random I pulled out this book. And what this book is, is The uh, Selected Letters of Philip K. Dick, Volume 4, 1975 through 1976. Oh, by the way, before I forget, if you folks want to comment in the comment section about this and you want to mention Philip K. Dick, I would advise you don't mention him by full name, just write PKD, because I noticed when I talked about this particular author before, uh, all the comments that mentioned him by name got held uh, for possible obscenity. And then I never saw them because I'm supposed to moderate the comments that have possible obscenity, but I never do. So, uh, so I'll probably never see your comment if you mention him by name. Just say PKD instead of uh, using his full name because they think you're saying something obscene. Anyhow, so Philip K. Dick was a science fiction writer who, uh, who is the author of uh, several very interesting books that get into very interesting philosophical ideas about what it means to be human and the nature of God and the nature of reality and all sorts of stuff like that. And he was one of the first authors who got me really hot and bothered about philosophical ideas about the nature of reality and so on and so forth. But he was also kind of crazy. Um, I think he did a lot of drugs and it, it kind of twisted his mind a little bit. And so even though he was a very smart man with some very good ideas, he also was a, a kind of a... He, well, that's what I want to get into in this video, so let me leave that aside. So uh, this is, as the title suggests, letters that he wrote to various people. Apparently he kept carbon copies of all the letters he wrote. He died in 1982, so there were, there were no uh, personal computers by the time he died, so all his letters were written on typewriters, but he apparently kept carbon copies of his letters, and that's, that's why we have them. And the particular letter, I just happened to open it at random, and I found a letter that he wrote to Ursula K. Le Guin. And Ursula Le Guin uh, was, or is, I believe she's still with us, so I'm going to say is. So Ursula, Ursula Le Guin is a, another science fiction author who is also very well known and probably, I think actually he mentions it in the letter, the reason that he was interested in writing to Ursula Le Guin is one of the books that Ursula Le Guin wrote was called The Lathe of Heaven. And The Lathe of Heaven is a book which even I think Ursula Le Guin herself admitted was a book that she wrote in an attempt to kind of write a Philip K. Dick book. So she wrote this book that uh, is intended to sound like the kind of book Philip K. Dick wrote. And I have read the book and it does really come across like a Philip K. Dick novel. Like if you wanted to read uh, a Philip K. Dick novel that Philip K. Dick didn't actually write, read The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula Le Guin. And I believe, well, I know there was a movie made about it uh, by, I believe, a, it was a movie for television made by a Canadian company, and I believe it is on YouTube. I saw it on YouTube 10 or more years ago, so if it hasn't been taken down yet, if you go searching YouTube for The Lathe of Heaven, you might be able to find it. And I thought the movie version was pretty good. It was done on a very low budget, and considering what a huge concept The Lathe of Heaven is, 
I was pretty impressed that they were able to do a good movie version of it with a with an incredibly low budget because it, it's a huge concept where a person is able to change the very nature of reality by dreaming. He has these kind of lucid dreams that change the nature of reality and he goes to a psychiatrist and this psychiatrist uh, realizes that his patient is able to change the nature of reality through his dreams and then the psychiatrist tries to start manipulating his patient's dreams to advance the psychiatrist's own ends but it's also played in a funny way so you don't know for sure if the psychiatrist knows that he he knows that he's doing this and it's really it's really kind of an interesting thing and it really comes across like a Philip K. Dick book because Philip K. Dick wrote about stuff like this and probably most of this video is going to be lost on you if you don't know anything about Philip K. Dick so so I'm sorry if that uh, if that uh, if that just gets lost on you so the reason I wanted to do this video is because I thought last night that it was a that this letter was a really good example of something that I've written about and talked about in this YouTube channel and I don't know if people have picked up on this because it's sort of a minor thread running through a lot of my books and blogs and YouTube videos but it's there and it's something that that I find interesting which is this phenomenon of a person who has some of what I consider to be really good and interesting ideas about the nature of reality and is kind of on to something. But then instead of going into it in, in a way that makes sense and is rational, the way sort of somebody like Dogen might have done it or the way somebody like Nisargadatta Maharaj or some of these people might have done it, instead ricochets off into the stratosphere and goes in a completely different way and just ends up in crazy town. Okay, uh, and and I see a lot of people doing this, not just science fiction authors, but people who are who are held up to the world as legitimate spiritual authorities. Uh, one of my favorite examples would be Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber, I think, is 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 an example of a guy who, whenever I read him, he sounds like a guy who starts off with some interesting philosophical ideas about the nature of reality, and then just woo right off into crazy town with them. Uh, and Ken Wilber, I think, is is interesting slash dangerous i don't know dangerous I, I i don't want to use that word but uh, i don't i can't think of a better word because he gets so close he's almost there but then he goes off into crazy town and i think a lot of his followers don't realize how how crazy he he is but he's 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 a nutcase uh and there's there's a bunch of people like that in the world of, of spiritual gurus who who are kind of they they got a kernel of of the real deal and they're 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 so close but they they've let their own egos kind of usurp whatever thing they've got and then they go they go off into into crazy land with it so I'm gonna read you part of the letter that Philip K. Dick wrote to Ursula Le Guin, Le Guin and see if I can comment on it and see if I can explain to you how I feel that this phenomenon works. Now, I reread this just before I came out here to do the video and I realized that it's a lot more crazy town and a lot less good idea than I thought it was last night. When I picked it up last night and started reading it, you know, in the middle of the night, it seemed like it had more good ideas and less crazy town then this morning when I looked at it again, I thought, oh, it's a lot more crazy town and less good ideas. But, you know, let's, let's just get into it and, and see where we go with it. Okay, so I'm skipping over a lot of it uh, because uh, a lot of it's kind of irrelevant. So he's talking to her about some article that uh, appeared in a uh, science fiction studies. Uh, I suppose it's a scholarly journal about science fiction. Uh, and stuff that referred to both Le Guin and uh, Philip K. Dick. And let me see if I can get to the part where it gets good. I can readily discern that much of the underlying experiences from which my own work have come somehow underlie your work and perhaps you, and perhaps you, if you see what I mean. 
It strikes me that whether you are conscious of it or not, whatever is influence, whatever is influencing my work, uh, and then hyphen, I mean making use of me really to put forth this work, and then another hyphen, that entity or drive is making use of you too. So I think that's an interesting idea that that what makes us uh, work, what makes us do something, is not ourselves. It's it's an underlying something that is not me. And that, that was one of the ideas I think is good. Because what makes, wh what I'm doing here, uh, the good part of what I'm doing here, my videos, my books, my uh, talks and things, and I've talked about this, doesn't come from the Brad Warner me. It comes from something bigger than me. That's, that's one of the good ideas. And I think Dick was, uh, Philip K. Dick was aware of that. It is not that I affect you or you me. It is that we are twin outcomes of a single underlying experience. What that experience is of, that we must discuss, for I know by now that it is a most important experience having to do with the nature of the substance of reality, and in parentheses, in contradistinction to the manifold appearances of reality. Okay, that's, that's where I think he's good. And then, then, now he kind of starts slipping into crazy town, uh, by and by. Once I read somewhere, we do not dream, we are dreamed. Okay, so far so good. That is, someone or something which is not I dreams us when we are asleep. Okay, here we're slipping a little bit. A prime mover confronts us and designs the fabric of our night's events. I say, truly say, in no idle fashion, Ursula, that are we sure, are we really sure that he who dreams us at night does not also dream us during the day as he who so dreams or so builds, and then in parentheses, I personally conceive of him as an artificer, a workman, our coenus, a cosmos, I guess, perhaps he changes and erases backwards and also now and then places us under something much like a spell, uh, uh, colon, a spell of enchantment so that we imagine, do you see, uh, imagine whole areas which are, as an architect must construct of necessity, what they call false work amid the permanent. <laughs> oh boy, that is a long convoluted sentence. And then there's a quote, and I'm going to skip the quote, and then he goes, now, Ursula, this is the dream universe cast over us, perhaps, in the daytime, benign and not to be feared, but still it is the true dream, uh, sorry, true dreamer in, uh, 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 sorry, um, capitalized, dreaming us along. My work and your work together show an awareness that the dream does not end when we wake up, nor begin when we shut our eyes. In the article by Ian Watson, the work of Charles Tart is mentioned. Now, Charles Tart, uh, I've come across this name a few times. I do not know much about Charles Tart, but everything I ever hear about Charles Tart makes me think, ooh, that's probably somebody to stay away from. Uh, I know his work, although only recently. Also the work of Robert Ornstein, never heard of him. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes, uh, I'm skipping over. Uh, aspects of this dreaming of us take these forms. Our reality can be manipulated retroactively, that is, our past can be rewoven and without hesitation as an automatic process, our several memory systems will fill in the blanks and make smooth the reweaving, i.e. we won't realize that alternations in our lineal time past took place. A certain portion of the phenomenal world which we encounter is hologram-like, projected and false to fill in missing spaces as in the time extension, missing elements are filled in along similar lines. Therefore, we see total continuity in both extensions, time and space, without awareness of dysfunction or rupture. But in truth, there are dysfunctions which, to return to my former term, the dreamer, in uh, capitalizes, ca capitalizes the word dreamer, causes us to gloss over or allows us to, perhaps it is less a manipulation than a permission if you see what I mean. 
in a, me in a meaningful sense, portions of our reality extensive in time and space are false, other portions are real, we have no way of determining which is which or even if this proposition is true. But this proposition is true because I saw in March of last year a rollback of the artificial portions. The term Veil of Maya comes to mind. After 10 months of studying and speculating, I've come to these conclusions. And then he lays out a bunch of conclusions. One, there are two types of time, lineal time and orthogonal time. I do not know what orthogonal time means. The latter being real time in that within orthogonal time, you have successive layers of deepening being. So being is capitalized and real time is capitalized. This is ontological time. I always forget what ontological means. And without it, there would be nothing but illusion, nothing but Maya, so to speak. Two, lineal time is a mere process or a cumulative time which conceals orthogonal time from our gaze. Three, the dreamer who determines both our sleeping dreams and our waking dreams, uh, Vid Tart, wishes to su wishes us to suppose the reality of the phenomena extensive in lineal time, but upon command wacket auf, I guess that's German, maybe some Germans know what that means, wacket auf, uh, these accretions within lineal time roll back to expose the ground of being. I don't see him rolling back. I must have pronounced it wrong. The dreamer, i.e. he who dreams us, can perform this absolute act at any time he wishes, called by the Christians God's grace or God's mercy. For the landscape thus exposed, not deformed, is quite a shock to us when abruptly visible. Uh, and it gets it gets crazier and crazier and that's about where i stopped reading there's a whole bunch of stuff about those in half-life are not dead nor the root slumbering under the snow the symbol of christ or dionysus in the final days uh, the, the about the dead coming back to life and uh, these being the final days and how uh the the winter uh, of of this kind of ontological time or whatever the hell he called it well, it lasted from 200 BC until 1974 AD and that spring was coming and that the uh, the Soviet bloc was going to be destroyed well he was right about that I guess and that didn't happen until after he died um, and so on and so forth it gets really weird and crazier and crazier as it goes along so that's the kind of thing I I was talking about and this is kind of what happens. The thing is, reality is, reality can't be described. You can only, the best you can do is kind of point at it. And people like Dogen realize that. And so whatever, what happens is, if you get a little glimpse, as sometimes people do, even ordinary people, even people like Philip K. Dick, even probably people like Ken Wilber, they, they'll, they'll get a little glimpse into a, a deeper kind of reality. A lot of people do this. And when they attempt to pin it down, the best you can do is you get kind of close to it. But what people will, will sometimes do when they get kind of close to it is they'll, they'll, they'll figure they're closing in on it and they'll try harder and harder to pin it down. And the harder you try to pin it down, the more you go into crazy town. The more, the more weirder it gets. And what you, tr what you start doing is you start superimposing your own fantasies upon it. Now, this is the thing that last night I was thinking, gosh, I'm really glad that I never got into religious stuff. Like, I've never been a fan. Like, I'm interested in religious stuff, obviously, because I do this channel and I, I talk about it. So, you know, I have this passing interest in Buddhist religious stuff and Christian religious stuff. But most, if you saw my, my bookshelves and things, I used to have my bookshelf behind me in my videos, you'd see that most of my interest lies in, like, bad science fiction movies, Godzilla, Three Stooges, uh, Flintstones, uh, garbage pop culture stuff, uh, uh, rock music. Uh, I have more band biographies and things, and and books on the Three Stooges and 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 Beatles and stuff, and the Who than I do about anything religious. So what that means is that if I go into if if I start going into fantasy land, it's science fiction, Three Stooges, uh, you know. Um, goofball fantasy land. So it's easy for me to recognize that, oh, I've gone into fantasy land. 
I did have that incident where Nishijima Roshi, my teacher, had to point that out to me because I went into science fiction fantasy land uh, at one point when I was trying to do what uh, Philip K. Dick often does, which was pin down one of my so-called you know spiritual experiences. I went into science fiction fantasy land, you know, and tried to pin it down to the expansion of the universe and and blah di da di da. And I, I don't even want to go into it because it's embarrassing and silly. If you happen to be the kind of person whose fantasies range into science fiction or physics or religious iconography or things like that, you'll find a lot of support. So you'll find a lot of support for that. And if if you're a if you're a uh, Ken Wilber type who, whose fantasies range into the uh, into the uh, religious and and into the psychological, you'll find a lot of support and a lot of people will go, oh look at that you you know you've got a lot of psychological stuff and 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 you you have your little um, moment of you know let's call it enlightenment or something, and you have your little moment of enlightenment have your spark. And then you try to understand that spark of enlightenment and you fill that, you fill it up with fantasies that are born out of a lot of psychological jargon and a lot of religious jargon. And you, you build an edifice up from that. Uh, you'll, find a, you'll find a receptive audience for that. And they'll, go, they'll all go, ooh, look at that. Look how, oh boy, you're a genius. And they'll, they'll fawn at your feet and they'll throw money at you and they'll go, ooh, that's so great. Oh, look at that. He's, he's a genius. He thinks uh, it's, it's the ontological, epistemological, uh, uh, coinus, chronos, cosmos. Um, see, I can't even rattle off a parody of all those religious psychological uh, words. But, you know, uh, soteria logical blah, 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 blah. you know you can if you can throw a lot of that at it uh, people will be impressed and then it forms this kind of feedback loop and and it, it's just a nightmare I, I, I think people become trapped in that so you got that kind of I hate to keep picking on Ken Wilber but there's really a lot of guys out there like that so it's not just Ken Wilber specifically but since I ju I got on him at the beginning of the video that might as well just make him my single target but really believe me there's a ton of people like that so you get into that and it becomes a big trap so you get into that and you you become like Philip K Dick and you're trapped into your your whole world of ontological bloobity bobbly goobly gook and you don't realize that you've you've built this edifice of fantasy around a little germ of of something that was probably genuine but you've just trapped yourself into all the thoughts and all the fantasies that your brain has made out of it and that's that's the one of the real dangers uh, that you can get into with this practice is that the ego will latch on to absolutely anything including the dissolution of the ego to maintain the ego so the ego will will gra grapple grapple that's not the word grab on to the dissolution of itself to preserve itself that's the that's the genius of some ego and if you're really smart you can just make you, you this, this is what I think is great i mean i'm not trying to toot my own horn but i'm really thankful that i'm number one into the my my um likes are so dumb <laughs> you know three stooges godzilla and garbage rock music and that i'm a, a kind of a dumb person that i just don't get it when it comes to when when people start getting intellectual i just don't get it that i'm kind of a dope uh because that there but for the grace of god go i into the ken wilbur territory or into the philip k dick territory where these people who are much smarter and much more into that kind of stuff that philosophical psychological religious stuff uh, they they get trapped into that uh, and i i somehow managed to to avoid it not that i'm you know anybody's great genius and everybody should follow me and don't follow me please don't because you'll just go into the path of the three stooges and it'll be awful but you know that's i think if you're dumb like me and into stupid stuff like me count yourself lucky that that i think is what i'm what i'm trying to say i don't know if i really said anything like that <sighs> anyway, this video is way too long, and I don't know if I've made any of my points, but I guess my point is, I, I just, you know, the, the idea of people who have a germ of a good idea or a genuine enlightenment experience, and they get, they get just kind of weighed down and uh, 
stuck into their own fantasy about it. Uh, how to avoid that, I don't know. I avoided it by having a teacher who sort of slapped me around about it. He didn't, he didn't actually slap me, but he said some things that were kind of harsh to me and got me out of it, and that was really useful. And may God grant you somebody who says harsh things about your fantasies or literally slaps you when you have them uh, because that, that can be really useful. So that's sort of my point. I don't think I made it very well, but there you go. That's, that's the video. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't very good. Anyway, if you want to help support me making more not very good videos that are too long, you can go to the URL you are seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. There you'll find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts. Those are my main and only ways, usually, of making money, and I appreciate your support, but as always, this is offered for free, so you don't got to support me if you don't want to support me. Uh, thank you very much for your support, though. If you do support me, we will see you later. Have a good time all the time. See you next time. Bye. Hey Ziggy, how you doing? Want to come inside and help me edit the video? Yeah? All right, let's go inside and edit the video, okay? Oh no, wait a minute. You just want to sniff the ground? All right, you can sniff the ground. I'll go in and edit the video. I'll see you later. Bye.